You chair of the Republican Party, and who are you? I'm Barb Sutter, and I'm the secretary of the party. Well, we have a wonderful panel for you today. Mitch Berg is going to be hosting a panel of our uh, RFL and labor affiliate groups here. Uh, he's got some interesting questions. They are important groups that we need to reach out to. Uh, we're very excited to, uh, to hear about what the answers are, what the questions are going to be. Uh, so please give them a big round of applause. Woo! Oh, well, good afternoon, and, and I'm glad to be for, here for what's becoming kind of a tradition. Uh, not just these forums, but rain coming down while I'm doing these forums. I was supposed to be here last Tuesday. It rained. Last year, I did the Attorney General Forum when there were multiple candidates. It poured. Uh, so uh, this is big. It, it, I, I'm a little bit of Scotland wherever I go. So uh, here's the deal. I'm going to introduce the guys. We're going to have them do a quick intro. Uh, I'm going to ask them some questions. Uh, avert your own boredom by coming up with your own questions. If you've got questions about either of the subjects that, that we have here, I did say either of the subjects, uh, come Come on up. Uh, while they're talking, I'll talk with you about what your question is, and we'll get you on the air, as they say. And so be thinking of things to ask, because that's the fun part here. That's why we have candidates here, so you can actually interact with them. I'm going to let them each pass the mic around as we do this. And with that in mind, uh, with no further ado, I'm going to kick things off by introducing Representative Tim Miller. Introduce yourself to the crowd. Sure. That's a good hint there, right? Uh, well, thank you, Mitch, and thank you, everyone, for being here today. I'm State Representative Tim Miller. I represent 17A, which is about 110 miles west of here. I have Swift, Chippewa, most of Renville, and four townships in Candy, Ohio County. And up next, uh, Representative Jim Nash. Good afternoon. I'm Representative Jim Nash. I'm Assistant Majority Leader in the House, and I represent Carver County, or as we call it, God's Country, here in Republican Booth. Um, I represent the majority of Carver County. And up next, Representative Jason Rarick. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jason Rarick. Uh, I represent 11B. That's Pine County and about half of Kennebec County, so right between here and Duluth when you go up 35. And up next, the one thing that is not like the others, uh, not an elected representative, not from rural Minnesota, however, a representative from Minneapolis, from the private uh, union labor community, Andy Lindbergh. Hi, I'm, uh, uh, I am not Give a representative. I <laughs> should tell you something. Huh? <laughs> I'm the union thug. So uh, we're, I've, I've got a different focus on issues than these guys do. Um, and we can get into that later. But uh, yeah, I am with the Carpenters Regional Council, a member of Local 68, Minnesota State Interior Systems. I'm on the pack. I give out money. Uh, so there it is. So I'm going to kick things off with a question here. If you have a question for any of the representatives or for the union thug, uh, <laughs> wave your hand, make your attention, uh, make yourself known. I will uh, come out and uh, and uh, we'll meet somewhere halfway. Cause I only got so much cable here, uh, and we'll uh, we'll figure out you know, when to get your question in, and we'll do it. So just wave your hand at me, and uh, I see you right down there, Amy. We'll get you on there. I knew this was going to happen. So let's tee things off uh, right now. In your district, uh, what is what what, what is the biggest challenge and what is the biggest opportunity facing the GOP in your district? We'll start with Representative Rarick here. Um, well, I think one of the, the things in my district, um, it, it's an area and it fits this exact message that we're trying to get across. Uh, rural Minnesota, a lot of farmers, a lot of people who work for a living, hard hats, uh, work boots, and for years and years they considered themselves just instantly a Democrat because of it. Uh, but these very groups are the ones that we're trying to get the message out to to say, look, they are abandoning your viewpoints on so many issues when it comes to the Second Amendment, when it comes to uh, the environment. Um, you know, we farmers, they want to protect the land. They need to use it for years and years and years, and yet that's not what's being presented. And so in our area especially, we're really trying to get that message out there that you can be a farmer or you can be a working person and be a Republican. Um, 
you know, and some of the other issues, you know, broadband is a, a big one that we really need to get broadband service out to our rural areas. And I think that's something that the Republican Party, you know, is really needing to get a hold of. And I think we can do a good job of that. I, I know Representative Miller believes the same thing. So we'll, we'll come back to broadband in a moment here because I work in the technology business. I grew up in a rural area. Uh, two, two thoughts near and dear to my heart. But first, uh, opportunities and challenges, uh, Representative Nash. So in, in Carver County, we have a good number of farmers on my side of, the, side of the district and one of the things that they have said clearly over the last number of years is you know we as Jason said we want to take care of the land but we're tired of governmental agencies telling us how we should manage the land and we fought very hard against the buffer strips and I heard a lot about that as I'm sure you guys did as well um, one of the other things that we actually have heard a lot of is um, the school tax for when schools go out to levy. Um, farmers were getting hit at a disproportionately higher level, so we've fixed that this past year. So those are the two things that have been good as a result of this last session, but one of the challenges uh, that I have heard uh, is transportation. And transportation through Carver County uh, east to west is on Highway 212. And if you remember when the Corridors of Commerce list came out for the projects that were funded, the governor put almost everything in the 494, 694, 394 area. And I think two weeks ago we had a young lady that was driving on Highway 212 and she was killed by a trucker. Uh, horrible collision and this is not an uncommon thing on Highway 212. So for a good portion of Carver County, it's four lanes, and then it constricts to two lanes, and then it goes to four lanes. That area where it's still two lanes, unbelievably dangerous, very slow, and farmers and people are telling us that that's a problem. And lastly, uh, we're seeing that there's a huge level of confusion for many people who have uh, voted Democrat for the majority of their life. They're beginning to wake up and they're beginning to see that uh, right here, that the Republican Party is really more effective for the farmers and laborers. Uh, I had a farmer tell me, you know, Jim, I've been a Democrat my entire life, and he says, and this is his quote, he said, I feel like the DFL is telling farmers to get the F out of the party. <laughs> we'll come back to that as well. Uh, Representative Miller. Thank you. Well, uh, my district is deep rural. Uh, my, one, my one county, Renville County, is the number one producer of corn in the state, and Candy Ohio County is, I believe, the, bi the biggest producer of turkeys in the whole world, certainly in the United States. And so agriculture, we of course have uh, we have the hard hats and, and work boots like Jason says, but really the opportunities out by me is to address do we want to grow agricultural opportunities, particularly in livestock, or do we want to, do we, oh, we have our favorite representative coming up, Representative Keel will be here in a second. She's going to up the intelligence. She's the farmer. She's going to school me with everything I'm about to say. But, but the opportunities for the Republican Party is to speak out and speak the truth that you support what it is that the farmers are doing. They, pr they produce something for us in the state. They are our economy out there. And I can tell you that's what my message has been. I've been served for four years now. And in my area, there are people. Now, in my area, a lot of the farmers grew up being Democrats, voting Democrat, right? They have flipped onto my side. I um, uh, just a little, a little piece of history. When I won my seat, I was the first Republican in over 30 years. And in my re-election, I actually won by more, talking to the farmers, talking to our producers, telling them what's in, or speak, listening to hear what's important to them, and showing them how the Republican Party is supporting that. And uh, that's what we can do as a Republican Party: is continue to communicate that that we support them. Now, we've been joined by someone else who walked in. Of course, I know who this is, but for the benefit of everyone in the audience who, who doesn't know, please introduce yourself. Good afternoon. Um, when you referred to being in deep, deep rural Minnesota, I really am. I'm Deb Keel. I live in the northwest corner of Minnesota. It takes me about five, and a half, five hours to get home, and I am a farmer. I am the only female farmer in the legislature. Um, but we're encouraging women to uh, farm and, and uh, very important, uh, actually I'm seeing some women that are farming there. So my husband and I um, are transitioning, our son is taking over the farm and uh, we raise wheat, soybeans and sugar beets. In fact, they're getting ready to lift sugar beets tomorrow. 
You sound like you may be from the greater Thief River Falls metro area, perhaps, somewhere up there. Uh, my grandma's from Middle River, and I am from so far in rural, uh, far out in rural Minnesota, it was actually North Dakota. So uh, great to meet you. Let's pass it down to Andy Lindbergh here, because he's the uh, he's the, the Walter. By the way, he, he took the vacant chair. That was supposed to be a missing man formation for the late Senator McCain, but that's fine. We'll work with it. Uh, Andy right. Lindbergh uh, from the Carpenters Union. He's our representative union thug here. And first of all, we should do two things. Explain your affiliate, the affiliate for which you're appearing here. And then we'll do the same question we had for the rest of the uh, the panel here. Opportunities and challenges for Republicans in uh, your territory here. Okay, very good. Um, I'm with the Republican Labor Alliance. And I'm, pers I'm, I'm coming at this process from a different perspective. But in truth, I actually represent who these guys are reaching out to. I was a strong DFLer right up until the point of uh, my mid-30s. Okay, and when I was 35, I determined that the DFL had nothing to do with me except my union dues. And I walked. That was 30 years ago. And of course, I couldn't become a Republican because I'd been so thoroughly uh, indoctrinated. Really. So I went to the Libertarians, and I hung out with those guys for five years. And then I decided they weren't doing anything, so I came over to the Republican. But I was in the leadership of my Senate district for two years before I could spit out the idea that I was a Republican. I was so thoroughly brainwashed. And that is part of what I'm dealing with here in my, my uh, local unions when I'm, really, when I'm relating to the other union guys out there. They are with us on the issues, but they have been, so many of them, simply brainwashed that they need a leadership out there to say, hey guys, it's okay to be a Republican, and quite frankly, we're with you. Excellent. Uh, now, if you have any questions for anybody in our panel, for anyone or everyone in our panel, just wave your hand. I'll, I'll see you. We got our first question here from the crowd. Uh, from St. Paul, Amy has a question. Go right ahead. Uh, yes, it's with regard to the Carpenters Training Center in St. Paul. I think it's on Plato. I was curious as to how people might be involved, able to get involved in education at that facility question about Carpenter's education. She, her question was about the Carpenter's Union's training facility down on Plato Boulevard. She's wondering how people can get involved in and use or otherwise take advantage of that facility. I'm not familiar with the one on Plato Boulevard. I, in the metro area, we have two training facilities. Um, we've got the millwrights and the um, pile drivers are over off of 280. Is that the one you're talking about? Uh, okay. Okay. Sounds like we got a serious so, training opportunity here. So um, I know a little bit, uh, another thing about me, um, I'm a union electrician, have been for 26 years, so I'm IBW 110. Uh, uh, the Carpenters Training Center has opened their doors to state representatives to come tour um, quite often. Uh, the training center is for members of the union, uh, but the, it's one of the things that I've been working on hard is the trades especially are one of these groups, they are just so short of people in the in the industry, um, and so they're reaching out. Um, so the, if you know somebody who's interested, um, stop in to the center, and there are people there to talk to uh, about how you apply and get connected with uh, local contractors. Um, I think that's kind of, for the carpenters anyway, uh, you try to get connected with a local contractor who will hire you, and then you get into the training program. Now other unions have it, you go through an interview process and you get brought in, and then they refer you out to um, contractors. But So there's a couple different ways, but if they stop in, they, they can help you out. Oh, sorry. Did, uh, Representative Miller has a follow-up, and then we'll go to Andy Lindbergh, if that's okay. I'm just going in order in which I see people's hands. Sounds it's kind of like well, Jeopardy here. Yeah. Well, I think, I think Representative Rarick makes an excellent point about the trades. The state of Minnesota has a deep need for people to get into the trades and work. And so we have our junior colleges, which are the tech schools are really training people. We have the excellent facility, which I have toured in St. Paul. It's a wonderful place. One of the opportunities that we have as a party, kind of going back to that question, tying these two together is, is we have a great opportunity to reach out to young people. And I, I go to some young people and they, I say, hey, do you, wanna, do you wanna earn six figures in your salary? And they're of course say yes. And I say, become a plumber, okay? So one of the opportunities that we have is to reach out to people and say there, there are, there's a lot of work in my area for a lot of these trades if we get people properly trained. And I think that union shop, uh, the, the training center, uh, I forget its formal name, but that's an excellent place for someone to go in and say, hey, I want to know how to become part of the trades. Once they get trained up there, there is plenty of work for them out throughout Minnesota. 
And Andy Lindbergh, who I'm trying not to call Representative Lindbergh as hard as I can. I did run twice, <laughs> but that was Karen Clark's district. At any rate, um, on Thursday nights at the Regional Council, which is located on Olive Street across uh, 35E from uh, Regents Hospital, we do have an open house. In addition to that, uh, the Minnesota Building Trades are doing a number of outreach programs through a variety of venues to try and find uh, new people uh, to come and join us in our, our uh, apprenticeship training programs for all the variety of, uh, of uh, trades out there, not just the carpenters. So there's quite a bit of outreach taking place, and if you want to talk to me after this, uh, I'd be glad to give you more detail. Not to be outdone, Representative Nash has some feedback. So for the last two years, both Representative Rarick and myself have championed uh, youth skills training. I had a bill that was called VPSEO, which would allow high schoolers to uh, enter vocational school and get credit for both vocational school and high school. So Representative Miller is very correct in saying that many of these jobs that need to be filled, we can find people to fill them uh, in the ranks of high schoolers. So that's another thing that uh, as you begin looking at things as, as uh, down ticket as school board races, you should be asking the, uh, the receptivity of your school board members as to how much would they support that. Uh, I know in, in my home district of 110 uh, Waconia schools, it's a, great, it's a great idea, people love it, um, but we both pushed very hard to, uh, to get and passed uh, youth skills training, which takes 16, 17 year olds, gets them while they're still mostly young skulls full of mush in high school, and uh, gets them some ex exposure to these, uh, these good jobs. And you know, a lot of them will walk out of high school and into a job where they can make a really good living. Absolutely. So we've got a question for the five of you here. Now, it, 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 these, these days, a lot of you, especially with the RFL uh, t-shirts on, make the very valid point that the, the DFL long since stopped uh, re relating to the farmers out there, and they should really just drop the F from their name. And uh, the L, you know, outside the public sector unions may be more the same. Hard to, I think that may be Andy, one of Andy's uh, goals here. But yet, they're still out there. Democrats are still out in, in outstate Minnesota, in greater Minnesota. Uh, they still win offices. They still uh, they still represent their people in the in the legislature. Um, and I get this. I grew up in a Democrat family in rural North Dakota. My mom ran for office, lost, but uh, I'll sh show you how far out to the left she was. So they are out there. The question I have for each of you, and a slightly different spin on it for Mr. Lindbergh, is going to be: What is? How, how do you make the sale with the Democrats that are still out there in Greater Minnesota? What is the value proposition uh, for a lifelong Democrat farmer in rural Minnesota to come over to the dark side and go red with us? We'll start with Representative Nash. Well, I would say look at what we've done. Don't listen to what we say necessarily, but look at what we've done. In the last number of years, we've made massive investments in roads throughout rural Minnesota. We made massive investments in townships. Townships are now getting road uh, aid from the state where they've never gotten it before. Uh, we've lowered taxes. We've made it easier for people to succeed. Uh, you know, you've got a group of people sitting up here and down in St. Paul on our side of the aisle that recognize that farmers are small business owners. You know, Deb and I got to go to a, a, uh, an event one time in, in Colorado and she told me all about her family farm. She's a small business owner. And that's not the demographic that the DFL is going after. They are not remotely interested, in my opinion, in that. Uh, so I, I think that if you look at what we've done, you've seen lowering taxes, investment in roads and bridges, um, the statewide business property tax went down because of us. So all of these things to me say that we are the ones that are more interested in both the farmers and the laborer, and back to the comment that my farmer made, he feels like he's been told to get the F out, so. <laughs> I was gonna let you do that. Let's uh, go to Representative Keel here. Keel, did I pronounce that right? Yes, Okay. Thank goodness. very much so, I uh, appreciate that. Uh, you know, when I think back at the years, uh, the challenges we've had in the legislature in agriculture, it is to make sure that my friends and neighbors, maybe that are, are Democrat, understand what's happening in St. Paul. And a lot of people think, oh, you know, we don't, we just worry about the federal government and how they affect us in agriculture. And that happens. But we have to get our product. Minnesota farmers produce not just food for Minnesota but we do it for the United States and actually the world. So if we are not successful, people starve. So it, it is that serious. 
And we need to make sure that when we're controlling uh, the things that are happening in our farms, that we are part of the voice. And one thing I would point out, and my farmers get very frustrated at this, is at St. Paul, uh, the conversation are going to how we should be farming, our farming practices. And I have to tell you, when I was first there one time, I'm in Ag Committee, and I'm listening to some conversation, and I thought, we do all of this. Why are we talking about this? So I called up my husband and I said, here's what we talked about today. Why does this seem so foreign to all of them? And he said, well, Deb, you know, we're, we're um, away from, uh, we have really good research up in northwestern Minnesota. We have um, the research uh, area that uh, is aided by the University of Minnesota in Crookston. And the education and the technology that we do for farming is far superior to what people realize. Um, in fact, uh, just this weekend, or just yesterday, I was out in our ATV with my husband pulling beets. Now, why would you do that? 10, 10 uh, inches, 10 feet of beets. And we pulled them and we counted them. They went into two different pails, why? Because one was ridged and one wasn't. I won't go into the detail of why we ridged and didn't. Well, but everyone what he knows was looking, that, come on. <laughs> what, what he was looking for was how effective the ridging was as opposed to the not ridging. And um, we actually put nitrogen underneath the ridging. Well, we do it for both, but the ridging holds it in a little better, and so that's what we're thinking. But we're looking to see, does the beet take that up in that time frame? So we're uh, constantly ourselves doing that, and I think our farmers really, or our farmers feel like St. Paul is not listening to them. In fact, I know that that's the fact, and that we're doing some technology that isn't even being used, and I think the bigger frustration is, um, um, my neighbors saw it clearly when Governor Dayton came up to our neck of the woods and went to the university and met with them, heard what they said barely, and walked out the door. And they were very, very frustrated with, well, he didn't even, he didn't even ask any questions, and then found out they hadn't even researched the science. So they had no idea, is this affecting us or not? The nitrogen is affecting parts of Minnesota. But that's, that's kind of part of what is going on. So the word is out, and I have a lot of uh, farmers that are changing gears because they're looking for support. This is good, because when I was in Vegas, I put $200 on that ridge, non-ridge thing at the, at the ag book, and I'm kind of hoping for you here. Let's go to Representative Miller here, and then, we'll, uh, and then Representative sure. Rarick, and then we'll go to some audience questions. Okay, so the simple fact is, when you say, how can we reach out to these people that have historically or traditionally voted Democrat is, is the simple fact is, is that we represent them and have more common things with them than our Democrat counterparts in St. Paul. So we go in with that confidence and we communicate with them. There's an incredible frustration in rural Minnesota, particularly in ag, with some things that just don't make sense. I want to give you an example of this. Uh, Representative Nash reminded me of a story that I told. Talk about sugar beets, I drive a sugar beet truck. We start in about a week or so as well, down by us. And the plant is just 10 miles south of my house. I've gotten pretty involved with them legislatively. Like I said, I drive my truck. Well, the sugar beet is just this big, huge, kind of white beet that's in the ground, okay? So when it's in the ground, before it goes over the scale and you weigh it, it's a sugar beet. When it goes over that, it becomes industrial product. As soon as it goes over the stale, it becomes industrial product. Now here's what the implication is. Here's a couple quick examples. There's a little bit of dirt left on the beets. They were underground, so they wash them off with water. That dirt that is in the plant for years, the MPCA, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, said that was industrial waste. That's not dirt. So they wouldn't let them bring it back out of the plant. It had to be, so down in Renville, they were just storing this stuff in big piles. Southern Men Beet Sugar Cooperative paid the University of Minnesota to do five years of research. And you know what they concluded after five years of research? It's dirt. Okay? So those beets, once they're in the plant, we have, we've had some... Uh, there's just different reasons why there's some that they haven't been able to process into sugar and they want to take out. It is a very laborious effort to get these beets back out into the fields, or which, by the way, they can return nutrients into the ground. But just to get those back out there and get them tilled in is an incredible thing. Farmers get frustrated with stories like this saying, why can't we just... Here's one other quick one. When rain falls, when it hits the ground, it's called it's called uh, storm storm water or storm um, yeah storm sewer water. Yeah, okay, just rainwater. Okay, if it hits a beat, 
it becomes wastewater and has to and has to be treated. There's nothing wrong with this. It's rain hitting dirt which makes mud. But the MPCA is really restricting. They're looking at a couple of the a uh, couple of the uh, beet co-ops. They're going to have to start building lined retention ponds to hold this rainwater. Southern Mint Beet Sugar Cooperative, which is not as big as Crystal, okay? And it's not huge. They're estimating it's going to cost them $18 million to install these ponds. That doesn't make sense to our producers, so we communicate that, hey, this doesn't make sense to us either, and they start listening. we got Joseph Heller on line two. Let's go to Representative Rarick, and then we'll take an audience question. I, I think what uh, was brought up by all three of these kind of gets, can get tied up into one thing, government regulation. We have a bunch of people that sit in St. Paul and think they can figure something out by talking to a, some supposed expert, and they're going to tell farmers how they can and cannot operate. And I think that's how, why so many farmers especially are looking at us, because we're saying, you know better how to protect your land. Because, we, like we said, we all know farmers are more interested in making sure that their land is going to be productive for years and years to come, or they put themselves out of business. So they want to make sure they're using it correctly. They're doing research. They're partnering with the University of Minnesota and so many other places. They're looking for best practices. They don't need bureaucrats in St. Paul or out in D.C. telling them what they can and cannot do. And they know that it's the Republicans that are fighting for that. And, and there's some of the same things on the labor side. You know, regulations that are being put in the workplace, um, what you can and cannot do. One of the things that I'm beating my head against the wall, um, trying to get it so that we can get kids into construction industries to see if they like it or not. But yet on the federal level, they passed a law saying, you can't be on a construction site if you're under 18 years old. Well, how do you get labor laws, child protect? So unless your parents own the company, you're not allowed on the construction site unless you're 18 years old. So how does a kid get a summer job with a local contractor to make good money to get ready to go to school when we won't even allow them there? And these are the types of things that you know, people have put in place because we need to protect people. And we need to say, you know what, there are dangers, we get it. But our contractors, especially when we look at industry, their insurance rates are affected tremendously by their safety programs. We don't need government to come in and regulate it. Our insurance companies are doing a very good job of that. So through the private sector and through things like that, we are getting to best practices. So I think that's how we win people over. I'm hearing a report that Alice Hausman's been seen out in the research farm with a seed cap on her head. I think she's making a play here. Uh, Andy Lindbergh, uh, I did, don't want to short you on this here. How do you make the sales pitch to your union colleagues to uh, switch to Big Red? You know, I really think that a significant amount of it is just having somebody willing to stand up in front of them and say, you know what, I'm a Republican. I can't, I can't, the, last, the first time I went to a uh, Minnesota Building Trades convention as a delegate from my local, the regional uh, secretary, the executive secretary treasurer and one of his vice VPs were there and, they, and, and he looked at me and he said, are you really a Republican? I said, well, yeah, I'm a Republican. He said, well, are you Republican, just Republican or, or you know, are you pretty, pretty serious about it? I said, well, look, I'm on the state central committee. I've been a candidate. I'm in the leadership of my Senate district. Yeah, I'm a Republican. And the guy reached over and he shook my hand and he said, you are the first Republican I've ever actually met. Now, I thought that was pretty lame, but I think that's an indic indication of what we're up against. And quite frankly, a lot of these guys out there, when I get on a job site and I get into some pissing contest with some liberal, um, I'm not afraid to speak up. Uh, it's not been one of my problems. I'll have guys come up to me after the fact go, and I'm with you. Uh, <laughs> They don't want the hassle. They're concerned. So I think to a large degree, it's just having somebody willing to get out there and say, it's OK. Here it's almost are. word for word the same as a discussion I had with somebody in a newsroom when I was 23. Representative Nash had one more bit, and then we're going to go to the audience. So we, we had a, a bill to put a constitutional amendment on the ballot for this fall. And it was to dedicate a portion of the sales tax on automobile parts for roads and bridges. And I serve on the rules committee and it had to get a rules waiver. And it came to rules and it was a long protracted debate. 
And Jason George, the president of the 49ers, uh, testified and he says, you won't let us build pipelines, you won't let us build mines, you won't let us build bridges, you won't let us build roads, what will you let us build? And that was to the DFL. So we were pushing to get that on the ballot and here's a, here's a guy that for most people, if you said he's a president of a union, you would say, oh, well, he's a, he's a DFLer, he's a union thug. Uh, the message was very, very clear that day that he was looking at the Republican caucus as somebody who was championing their cause to build roads, bridges, mines, uh, and pipelines. All right, let's go. Let's hear it. Let's go to the audience here. Andrew, you have a question for the panel? Yeah, uh, I actually live in Minneapolis, but I help my dad farm down by New Prague. Um, and that buffer strip is actually affecting us. I figure we've probably, we haven't seen a lot of effects because we probably only lose about, I don't know, three quarters of an acre, maybe an acre. But I know there's people with, with long distances next to creeks or drainage ditches that are losing multiple acres and thousands of dollars a year. Uh, and, and I personally think that 50 feet is, is quite excessive for a buffer strip. What if, if we get a Republican governor and we hold both the House and the Senate, what do you think we can, can do about this uh, and, and, and hopefully maybe get some of that land back? Looks like Representative Keel's all ready to go. First of all, what for all the city people in the audience, what's a buffer strip? <laughs> it is the strip between where the water flows in the ditch and the field. Now, first of all, uh, you, know, you made a very good comment. We don't want our dirt, our soil, flowing down the ditch. By the way, if it goes too far because of some erosion, we got to go dig it out. So we have to have somebody take it out, put it back in the field. Um, what I would say about the discussion is we do need some water regulation. That's just obvious that, that, that we need to make sure that water flows and it protects our water, our, our, our um, lakes and streams. But we have gone way past the 50-foot buffer strip in certain places. Doesn't even make sense. In fact, it can even create a larger problem with nitrogen. And and uh, you know sometimes it needs to be three feet. Sometimes it needs to be uh, whatever. You know, two feet. It it. What is important, um, I have some land right by my house and I've gotten my letter from my soil conservation and it says you've got to create a buffer on this field and my husband and I looked at each other. Now the first, first uh, uh, 200, no, it's a thousand feet is my yard. The buffer there is trees. I've got uh, at least 20 feet of large trees in that area. That's, that's plenty of area and then the rest is field. Well this field goes up like this and then drops into a ditch. Well in order for the water to go up and over the whole place has got to be flooded. Well at that point who cares where the ditches are because it's and I live in the valley so when we have water it's like pouring water in some places on a table. It runs everywhere and that's just the way it is because the Red River flows north and it doesn't melt in Canada as quickly as it does down in far, uh, Moorhead. So that becomes a problem. But um, the problem is, is that the state, Governor Dayton and our, our departments said, oh, we're going to manage it from Minneapolis Saint, or St. Paul. No, we need to manage it from our counties and our, and our elected officials in that area so that we can make sure that what is done in our counties and our townships is what's correct for, and I would hope that a Republican, well I'm sure a Republican governor is going to bring back the reasonableness of uh, managing that in our own areas. Let's go to Representative Miller now. Well I think Representative Keel really answered it very accurately. I'm a, I'm a little bit more blunt to the point. Um, I've, I've been fighting against this uh, buffer bill in law ever since it started, and I've been fighting ever since. Uh, they, they, first they said this was to protect habitat of pheasants, and then when that didn't really go anywhere, they then switched it over to, uh, to uh, water and soil, and then this buffer law doesn't really address those needs, so they say, well, this is just completing the original law that was there about determination. Well, anyone that's in agriculture, knows that this goes way beyond the determination argument. And so with a Republican governor, I can tell you that my choice 
is to just flat out repeal it. But that's easy for me to say I'm one of 134 and we're not even talking about the Senate. I can tell you for certain we're going to bring back some common sense and we are going to stop with this broad brush painting of, uh, of addressing issues and really address, if you, have a, if you have land that is sloping up to a ditch and it has a lip and that's all grass, that's probably going to be enough. But perhaps also full of industrial waste. Uh, Representative Nash. So I, I have a list of farmers that I call when we have policy issues up before us. This one farmer that I'm thinking about is also one of our soil and water board uh, members, is Bob Barant. And I called him and I said, Bob, if this were to happen, what happens to your arable land? He says, I would lose uh, a quarter or a third of my arable land because he's got streams that run through in various ways through his land. If he has to go 50 feet either side, he loses an enough land that it makes it n less interesting to actually farm. Well, your turn. And I think the other thing that uh, if we elect a Republican governor, what we'll get back to is we will get away from this one-size-fits-all policy making for Minnesota. We saw it with the buffers. We saw it with ditch mowing. Uh, we saw it with a number of other issues. You know, I get it when you're looking at um, southwestern Minnesota and you would say, hey, we don't want to mow ditches at certain times of year because, you know, for habitat, things like that. But you get into my area and you say, hey, we can't mow this ditch because because we got to protect the butterfly and we got to protect the pollinators. And you're looking at 5,000 acres of grassland beyond that ditch. And so when you tell the township that you can't mow that ditch so that the sight lines for the vehicles at these intersections are safe for people, because uh, it, it's crazy. So I think it's where we, just like Deb said, we have to get back to this idea of relegating state control and giving it back to counties and allowing soil and watershed districts to work with farmers and say what's right for your piece of land to protect the waterways. Andy Lindbergh, I'm sure the term buffer slip means something, a strip, means something entirely different in the world of carpentry, but uh, uh, regulations and, and their nagging effect on, on productivity, on earnings, how does that affect uh, people in the union? How's you pa uh, and how do you tell your fellow, u fellow union thugs about that? Well, one of the issues that, uh, that affected us in, in talking about the mines and whatnot was the regulations that were involved in uh, getting the mine approval. Uh, when <clears throat> the hearings were present down here in the metro area in Duluth, uh, you can believe that we had a really good showing from the membership. Um, and we weren't paid to show up. We, we actually showed up out of our own concern for this and the idea that the folks up there in the range ought to be able to make a decent living doing something that's valuable. Um, with regard to other stuff, well, quite frankly, um, you know, I've, I've been in the trade since 1960s, uh, before there was an OSHA. I'm not necessarily against all the regulations that OSHA has implemented. The fact that I'm alive is a good thing, but uh, I <laughs> did a lot of dumb stuff. But uh, at any rate, there's, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of issues out there with regard to the uh, Republicans and, and labor that uh, really is just fear-mongering on the part of the DFL because it suits their interests. Uh, we've been very successful here as carpenters in getting legislation passed that uh, was important to us when there was only Republicans in charge. And uh, I point this out to my, my fellow members all the time. And when it comes to issues that are not directly related to the trades, uh, other issues, social issues that are important to us, well, quite frankly, these guys are more in line with the Republican Party than they are in the uh, inner city Democrats every day of the week. So. I can make that case um, all day long. We got about 20 minutes to go here. We got a few people in the audience who want to get in questions, so I'll urge short questions and punchy, concise answers uh, to the best of your ability. Here, let's go to uh, Dave from, I believe, Plymouth. You have a question from Crystal. Yes, uh, for uh, for labor, what is the most important law we can either pass or repeal to help labor in Minnesota? And other than the buffer strip law, what is the most important law we can either pass or repeal to help farmers in Minnesota? Let's start with Representative Rarick. What's on the hit list or the not hit list uh, for this uh, for this session in terms of important bills to uh, pass or or, or toss. Um, I think one one of the, the ones that keeps coming up uh, discussion comes up over and over um, at the house uh, dealing with prevailing wage fireworks. and oh well, yeah fireworks but I don't think that. <laughs> um, but I think that's something 
um, that as we look at it, and I think as more and more of our members have been out to the training facilities, um, we're starting to see the value. Um, and, and I'm not completely opposed to changing the formula on how we calculate prevailing wage, but when we look at the value that our trading centers bring and how they create this qualified worker, I think we're starting to understand that the prevailing wage as we've thought about it for years and years in the past, actually there are some very strong benefits to it. But we as Republicans need to approach it from a different way than what the Democrats have. Because the Democrats say it's just all about a living wage, living wage. To me it's about training and making sure we have qualified people working. And so the other thing as we talk about it, it reminds me as everybody keeps saying it, we have to call them Democrats. We have to quit saying DFL because they don't represent the farmer and they don't represent the laborer across the board. And so, you know, they're Democrats. And we, you know, we have to look at prevailing wage in a different way than they do. And like I said, I think in rural, some of my rural areas, um, we end up with the same prevailing wage that's in the metro area. And that, that's not it. And I know it's the same thing in Representative Miller's area. So we can tweak that formula, but I think you know, we need to look at prevailing wage as a thing that is actually beneficial to these projects and to the workforce down the line. Let's see, if we're gonna retire DFL, we gotta replace it with Democrats, uh, non-profiteer, academic. DNA party, I think it works. Representative Nash, your answer. I'm going to take it in a different direction, a non-policy answer. You want to know what a lot of Republicans can do to change the way that, that uh, farmers and laborers look at us is destigmatize people who have to wash their hands at the end of the day. We really suck at that sometimes. Um, you know, Frank Long sitting there in the audience runs a landscaping business. Probably wash your hands every day when you come home, got dirt under your nails. Uh, people who farm for a living, they get filthy dirty. And a lot of folks in the Republican Party look down their noses at that and we should not. These are the people who built our, our country and built our state. We should embrace them. We should go out of our way to make it known that we want people who wake up every day and want to go and work hard and that we should make sure that we're getting regulations the hell out of the way. Yeah. Representative Miller. Well, yep, anyone sure. that hears me talk for long hears me. I'm not a big fan of the DNR or the MPCA. And so what policies can we do to affect positive change, we can build the Enbridge pipeline. We can allow mining up north. We can allow the growth of the livestock industry in agricultural areas. Uh, all these things, we, we can allow for irrigation. You really get into the weeds of some of the crazy, I told you a couple of the stories, I won't go into, I could spend all day on these stories. You can. And I won't, I promise. Uh, but we need to allow our workers to work. We need to allow our farmers to farm. We need people who build our economy to go out there. I, I'm so tired of clausing it as in a responsible way because who among you are irresponsible at your work? Okay? There are rules that need to be put out there for the bad operators, but what we do is we put rules out there for not only the bad operators, but the good operators too. And we start with this presumption that everyone is a bad operator. That's something that the Democrats have a really bad time with. They presume at first someone's doing something wrong, how can we correct them? We need to facilitate, we need to help people do the things that they naturally want to do, and that's how they're going to succeed. Representative Keel. I will, I will wrap this up by pointing out also that our regulations also curb our children from working. Um, now, my 15-year-old grandson has a farmer's permit and he's out running a huge tractor, working ground. He's more adept at setting up that computer than my husband is often, but Grandpa can call him and they figure it out and Grandpa works when he's doing soccer or whatever. But what's more important is I noticed with my metropolitan legislators, they're just shocked to find out that my eight-year-old grandson mows lawn on a lawnmower. Um, now my 13-year-old granddaughter's trying to learn because she wants to drive the big tractor and her dad says, until you can control that tractor in the yard, you can't get in a, you know, $250,000 tractor, so, so um, dad doesn't want it uh, being broken. But more importantly, the technology, the, the ability of these children to learn is so important, and whether it's, it's agriculture or construction trades, 
it is, you know, just electricity. All of those things are so important. That gets that kid gets kids interested in in high school. And and my dad made the comment one time. He said, you know, we had to earn money for a school uh, tour, a music trip. And he said, I said, well, how did you earn the money for that? And he said, well, we went to shops and swept out the you know, the business or the, you know, they go to the business and say, what can I do to make money to pay for this event I'm going to go to? And the businesses would provide them with jobs. Well, what better way than to get experience? Um, we have done career and tech classes. Uh, did you know that um, uh, machine uh, mechanics and um, uh, welding, a lot of our small schools can't provide a full welding class. So what the Minnesota legislature did was provide the funds to build a trailer that goes to the school and can provide six to twelve weeks of welding or manufacturing and the teacher is usually one of our uh, technical schools connected with the technical school so they come in and help the schools so they give the students a taste of what is possible and that I think is so important but we have to do that in other jobs too do you know that a kid working in a in a uh, grocery store can um, uh, put the let's see put the boxes on the stacker to tie them up but he can't push the button. Now he can't be employed till he's 16, well, 15, but uh, he can't be em uh, gainfully employed till he's 16. I think most 16 year olds understand when you push the button to stay away from the, the, the thing that's gonna strap the boxes together. And that's, that's more, more importantly, we have to do the education when we're uh, employing somebody. And I know we spend a lot of time working on that, so. We have a question in the audience from Ron in St. Paul. Uh, go ahead, Ron. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, as representatives of largely agricultural areas, I'm wondering what your thoughts are the impact of these recent tariffs and trade wars on Minnesota farmers and, and what you think should be done in, in the future directionally about this. DFL and the media are trying to make hay about this, uh, what's, uh, as it were, so to speak. Uh, yes, the Democrats are sounding the alarms, and, right. and yes, that is challenging. I will tell you that um, I think that our president needs to understand what it's like to market. Marketing uh, crops is different than marketing widgets. And, and I know he's good at some things, but that's something we need to teach him. But I will tell you that if you learn anything about marketing, and that's what I did before I came to the St. Paul, uh, my son finally said, Mom, we, wanna, we want control of selling the crops because you're down there and we can't get a hold of you and we don't know if we're supposed to haul the weed in or not. Uh, so I would do all the marketing. And um, any marketer will tell you, you do not market all your grain coming off the, uh, uh, off the field. Uh, and this is an interesting time. Uh, I would say what I was educated on was that you make sure your wheat is sold by June 1st and your soybeans are off, off the farm by July 1st. Don't have anything in your bins past that. Some people do that. I have a neighbor that did well because he waited till it was $10 wheat and you know, I've sold it for $2. But I am, of the, I am very hopeful for, and they, by the way, $2 won't cover my cost at all. It's closer to six, seven for wheat. Um, but what I need to make sure to do is, is I'm very hopeful that the governor will, or the president, will get this worked out because in the end, I think the end game is what is going to be best for us in agriculture, that we will be able to do that, to, to market. And um, guys, we provide some really good food. Um, in fact, our soybeans in Minnesota are, are high quality soybeans and are used for um, different products. Think about soybeans are all kinds of things. I won't go through the list, but your lipstick, uh, oil we put on our food, feed we feed our animals. Um, it's just unbelievable. Color crayons, it, it's, uh, you know, on a, on a pig, the only thing they don't use is a squeal. So. <laughs> Minnesota soybeans second only to North Dakota soybeans. I have that on great uh, authority here so far, wow. Representative Kim. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Go Bison. Anyway, yes. uh, thank you very much. Uh, on to Representative Miller here. Oh, I think I think the farmer in our group probably answered that question. I know, so I know. Let's move on. Oh, carry on here. Uh, we stay, stay, uh, okay, uh, so answered be, well enough? Okay. I'll be very quick. So I was having coffee with one of my uh, dairy farmers, uh, and he says, you know, I, it hurts right now. But I see the long game, and the long game is 
that this is eventually going to work itself out and that it's going to benefit the farmer in the long run. And, and they said, look, we are uh, fourth generation farmers. We're willing to stick it out because this is what we are and this is what we do. Uh, the long game is where we're going to win in the end. Representative Rick. Yeah. Um, when you talk to dairy farmers in Wisconsin, um, Canada a number of years ago put huge tariffs on dairy products. Canada was Wisconsin's number one market when that happened. And that sent Wisconsin dairy farmers scrambling, having to find new markets and stuff. So President Trump has been right that in the trade wars, or in trade with other countries, we've been on the losing end. And we finally have a negotiator in President Trump who's going to bring us back on a level playing field. So you're right, it's going to hurt for a little bit. And I think that's why they proposed this package, I think it was like 580, was it million or billion dollars or something for a one year help to get them through this. But in the end, we are going to be back on a level playing field with the rest of the countries out there and it will be beneficial for us. Andy Lindbergh, I'm sure the audience would love your opinion on farm tariffs, but we had a different question from the audience that may be more proximate to you and, that, and to the rest of the panel here. Uh, someone who had a little bit of mic fright, didn't want to come on uh, the mic, but had a question. What are, you, what are your organizations, plural, the, uh, the, the, the Labor Federation and the uh, RFL, what are you doing to help the GOP win this upcoming election? A lot of stakes are high in this election. What are you folks doing on the ground to actually win this thing? Andy Lindbergh. Okay, well, uh, first off, uh, I got money. <laughs> if, you're, if you're a, a GOP candidate and you're, you've been endorsed by one of our, our groups, Please come to me. Let me give you some money. Uh, the, uh, the other thing that we do is uh, I, I was out putting sign-ups for, uh, for Sheriff Stanick here a week or so ago. I mean, it's that kind of stuff. Walking in parades, whatever, lit drops. The things that I would normally do as a, as a BPOU chair organizing my uh, Senate district, um, I do with this organization also. Representative Rerick, how are you pulling your weight here? Well, I think the group in general, you know, it's all about messaging. Like I said, trying to reach out to people who are farmers and people who identify as the laborers um, and trying to get to them and say, it is okay to be a Republican. And I, Andy was one of them. When I, I always used to uh, feel when I was in a room of uh, union people that I was the only Republican. And when I was a room full of Republicans, I was the only union guy. Well, I spoke at one of these events that Andy was at and told everybody I was glad to be a union member and be a Republican. And Andy was one of the guys who came up to me and nudged me later and said, hey, I'm a Republican too. And I think that's exactly what we need to be doing, is just getting out there and talking to people, spreading that message about where we stand on the Second Amendment, where we stand on social issues, on how to bring our state agencies in line so that they serve Minnesotans instead of feeling it's the other way around. Those are the things that just give people that courage to get out there and say, I can lead, and that's the thing. The, we have to convince them they're not leaving the Democrats. The Democrats left them. So vote with the group that sides the same way and thinks the same way you do. So how are we going to win? We talk to all of our neighbors. We talk to our friends. Uh, we go door knocking. We go door knocking for other candidates across the state. Uh, we preserve the Republican majority in the House. Uh, and we talk to folks like you. So how many of you have not written out a check to a candidate and received your PCR? Raise your hand. Be honest. Okay. If you have not written a check, if you have not written a check to one of your Republican candidates, you submit $50, the state will send it back to you. It's the dumbest thing ever, but we take advantage of it because, because the Democrats are too. Uh, but fundamentally, we are out there working every single day, and we have people on our side that do represent more suburban districts, but they, they look to, to people like Deb and to Jason on farming and labor issues. The, the, the House Republican Caucus is very, very smart at what we're doing, and we're working our butts off to make sure that we can keep Minnesota from falling into the hands of the Democrats. So this is really the genesis of where the RFL came from, is, is we believed that the Republicans do represent farmers and blue-collar labor better than the Democrats do. How do we communicate that? So myself and Representative Jeremy Munson, who's not here today, he couldn't be here, we talked about this in, in his office one day and said, we need to be communicating exactly what we are doing here. So we, we, we kind of tweaked 
the DFL with the RFL, which by the way, um, as was well put by uh, Representative Rarick right after this happened, they didn't go out and say, hey farmers, how can we better communicate to you? They sent out a cease and desist against us for this logo right here. Okay. Yeah, they went, they went and got a lawyer. Now, the one thing that I want to punctuate, and this is where all of you can help as well, we have the RFL, and we have a little bit of fun with that at times, but we want to communicate to the people out there who need to know about the Republican Party. We are not here to speak to the choir. Uh, we are speaking to all of you to help, us, help you understand who it is and what we're trying to do, but our communication is outward. Our communication is to reach out into, the, into greater Minnesota, into the trade unions, into the farmers, to communicate what it is we represent and what we stand for, because we're confident that that's what they represent and what they stand for. So we ask all of you to help us communicate that as well in your communities. We do that. We're going to win this state. We're going to win the governorship. We're going to win a couple Senate races. We're going to win congressional seats. And that's how we're going to turn Minnesota red. Um, what, what do we do? You know, I, I would say that we really need to encourage people to put signs out. Sad as that meds may seem, it's really important. Recognition, name recognition is just super, super important. So getting those signs out to make sure, like uh, these gentlemen pointed out, talking to your friends and neighbors, making sure you encourage um, that conversation, and, um, and of course money. You know, you got to be able to have enough to get the word out. In rural Minnesota, we do, we do more radio ads. That doesn't work so hot in, in uh, metro Minnesota because it's just too drowned out. Drowned out but, um, You're telling me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I got a feeling it is going to be up north too this year, but we'll see. And then just really encouraging your candidates, support them when they come around. Um, I'm excited to say... Uh, uh, Jeff Johnson, our candidate for governor, is uh, coming up to northwestern Minnesota. Very proud of the fact that his wife is from my hometown of Crookston. Actually, her father was my band instructor. Mother was a science teacher. So um, I see them often. And I uh, was really thrilled that Jeff said he was willing to come on up. And we're going we're gonna to make sure that he know they, the farmers know that he will support them. So he's going to meet with them and uh, general public, and so we're gonna have a day of Jeff Johnson up in the northwest corner of Minnesota. All right. Got time and, for a, and we're working on others too, excuse me. Excellent. I've got time for about one more question here. I'm gonna do this. A couple of weeks ago, the uh, Min Post, which could be mistaken for a DFL PR firm, it is in fact a news organization of sorts, ran an article saying the DFL has always been the party of rural Minnesota. And they gave, I know, <laughs> and it was written by a pharmacist from Burnsville, so go figure. Uh, I know. Uh, but he gave five issues, and so there are five of you up on the stage. I'll let you divide these issues up. I'm going to ask you about what your organizations plan to do about the five issues that the official DFL PR firm, the MinPost, brought up. Those were rural broadband, transportation, uh, health care, local government aid, and child care. Five issues where, according to this particular person, uh, the DFL has all the answers. Now, I think we could call out the absurdity of several of these, but if you want to take one, and I'm not going to pick on too hard who picks what here, because here we are almost done. But uh, we'll start with Representative Keel and work our way down the line. If you could pick up one of those issues that, and, and what you want to do about them, uh, that would be fantastic. Representative Keel. Thank you. Um, I, I told the guys I'd talk about childcare. Been working uh, extensively in rural Minnesota. I've got some businesses saying we need childcare. What can we do to help get that taken care of? And so we've been sitting down talking about how we can help our, our uh, childcare providers. The other problem is we need people to actually work in child care, not to mention it doesn't, it doesn't pay terribly well. Um, after a college degree which we require, that becomes part of the problem. So this year, August 1st actually, we also said that if you need, if you are a child care provider that is maybe getting to the end of your, and you're thinking about somebody who did it when they were first newlyweds and didn't get child care education, but they've got 30, 40 years of taking care of children and Minnesota's regulation, they said, uh, the law now says that they have to go into the license and ask, but um, apply, but they will acknowledge that time frame that they have worked. So they'll be able to be paid at a better rate, 
help teach our younger people um, what needs to be done with childcare. And I think the other thing is we need to talk about the regulation. Um, we went overboard and uh, as government often does and now we're having those issues because of the regulation. A lot of um, uh, let's say moms my age have said, you know what, this is too much, I'm quitting, I'm done. So, and we certainly do need some infant care and, and child care, so. Um, and so anyway, but the businesses are interested in helping and I think that's a better way to go to support our families. Just a quick aside here, see how fast those five people sorted out who was gonna take what here? Can you imagine if we had complete control on dealing with the budget? I mean, come on, let's give it up here. <laughs> Representative Miller. So, if Min Post is saying that the Democrats better represent greater Minnesota on health care, that's a big joke. It was their actions in the last several years that caused the collapse of the individual market. The individual market represents about 80% of rural Minnesota. I can tell you in 2016, I had town halls, I had emails, I had phone conversations, I was in people's kitchens talking about how they completely lost their health care. Or if they could get it, it was very limited and incredibly expensive. So what we did, we did a series of many different things, but the, thing that, the two things I want to trumpet right now, we passed and got signed into law was agricultural co-op health plans which is now 40 square and Land of Lakes has a version as well and it's allowing farmers and other people in agribusiness to have a health plan that is affordable and actually serves the needs of their family. We're also going to be working in this coming year, uh, the federal government is going to allow associations. So for example, the Minnesota Association of Townships or Farm Bureau or some of these, I'm going to begin to work with them. We're going to be able to develop health plans through them to give people options. I can tell you the Democrats are pushing very, they're excited. They're we're talking about the single payer. For the sake of time, I won't go down the road of why that's a bad thing, but I can tell you that if we go to single payer, we are not going to have hospitals and clinics in rural Minnesota. You're going to have to drive several hours to get your health care because it's going to put those local hospitals and clinics out of business. An association of freelance software designers would be in order at some point. Representative Nash. So I took uh, local government aid, or as it's called, LGA. I used to be a mayor in the city of Waconia, and uh, let me tell you, LGA is a shell game. It's a farce. And the reason that I have a problem with it isn't because of the outstate people. And here's where MinPost got it wrong. If the Democrats are the champions of LGA, I would agree. Look at Minneapolis and St. Paul and Duluth and Rochester. Minneapolis has over $15 million in LGA, and yet they have the largest tax base. Cities like Waconia, where I used to be the mayor, when we first came in, we didn't have LGA at all, which was fine by me, because I didn't want it. But when they brought it in, then cities become dependent on it. They begin programming it into their budget as an, as an input, which is a horrible idea. But if you want to look at the Democrats being the party of LGA, you betcha, they are the, they are the party of LGA, not for the outstate, but for the big cities uh, in, in Minneapolis, St. Paul, Duluth, Rochester, who back the truck up to the gravy train and they fill up every single year off of your shoulders. Representative, give a hand, absolutely. Representative Rarick. So uh, broadband is an issue that has been uh, something that I've been dealing with since I got in. Uh, rural Minnesota, you know, it, People that are, when you're in the metro area, you don't think about it. You know, you can, you're, you pull out your phone, you've got a real good signal here, or you've got good internet access at home, you have multiple options to get your internet access here. It's not the same thing out in rural Minnesota. Um, and part of the problem, I was just talking with someone um, today, we've, we've invested money in getting these fiber lines put in, and we, you know, somebody gets a grant, they put in a fiber line, and they run it from here to Duluth, say, but they have control of it. And when a city like Pine City approaches them and says, we'd like to tap into your line, they can refuse access. So we have multiple fiber lines that run throughout this state, but you cannot get access to it. And we have kids, you know, our schools, so much of the homework is done internet-based. And in rural areas, you've got families coming in at night to park in the parking lot of the library because they leave their Wi-Fi signal on so that they can actually submit their homework because they, it would take three hours with the signal that they have at their house if they have it at all. Um, so 
I do understand there is this debate at the at the Capitol about hey technology is coming we're gonna have satellite service we're gonna have wireless service you know and wireless service can work in areas say out in western Minnesota where it can reach five six miles off a tower but you get into an area like mine and trees just eat up that wireless connection so we have to approach this and say again look at the areas of the state and what type of service is going to work we cannot just abandon the idea that we're going to put in fiber connections and connect to houses because we think a wireless technology is coming so I, we have to continue the conversation we have to continue to look at how we will do that um, reaching out and a, in allowing, I think, small areas to be able to put a plan together and then approach the companies and say, here's the plan and we want to partner with you to do it. Right now, the way it's set up, a CenturyLink or a company like that has to develop the plan. They have to then apply for the grant and then do it. Well, they're going to look at these small rural areas and say, there's not enough payback, so we're going to go to the high population areas and our students are gonna suffer and small com rural communities are gonna suffer because that's the number one thing businesses are saying when they're looking for an area to expand, what's the internet access? Without it, they won't go there. Andy Lindbergh got the transportation hot potato, go right ahead. I do, and uh, quite frankly, it's kind of an interesting one for me because our current political director, Adam Dunick, used to be uh, chair of the Met Council. And every time I speak with him, I rip him for the blue line. I hate the blue line. I used to take 55. That was such a high-speed avenue of approach. I loved it. And then they stuck that stupid trolley car in there. And what's even worse than that is that that trolley car is running a $20 million a year operating deficit. That means they lose $20 million per year on the operation of that. This doesn't take into consideration the amount of money that they put into building it. And now they've got the green line. And now they want to put one out into southwest uh, suburbs. I hate them. I, and, and quite frankly, if we weren't squandering so much money on these stupid trolley cars, we would have that money to put into greater lanes. We could have that money to put into the outstate Minnesota where they need that road infrastructure. And I used to live in Marshall. Believe me, I understand what it's like out there. So, uh, yeah, no, the, the, the Democrats in this state have no... No cachet on that at all. I uh, dream of taking the blue line to work someday. I take the green line, or as it as we call it uh, during 8 a.m. rush hour, the vomit comet. Uh, so <laughs> that's right. Anyway, I I paid for it. I'm going to take it. <laughs> that's right. Anyway, uh, I have a three o'clock hard stop, uh, just like the specials, just like the end of uh, session. Uh, we we're, we're pushing up to the last minute here, so I'm going to have to bolt. But I'd like a huge round of applause for our panelists, Andy Lindbergh, Jason. Rarick, uh, Jim Nash, uh, Tim Miller, and and Jeff Keel. Thank you very much. <laughs> Big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. I'll hand it back to Barb. Thank you all of, for coming. Thanks for coming to our last panel today of the State Fair. And thank you to Mitch Berg, and congratulations on making it through a rain-free session. Th thanks all of you so much.